Uh, Jan Paternum, I, I want to come to you last, please, for, for your thoughts. <coughs> yeah. <coughs> Excuse me. Thank you, Monsieur. I think we can all uh, dream of a new economic order, but if we really want to build a um, new, vibrant, uh, multilateral organization, uh, we need to meet, in my view, two conditions, like frankly in any diplomatic negotiation. One is to define clear mutual benefits, right? And the second is to have strong, equal players. So let me elaborate a little bit on that. Um, how do we achieve mutual benefits? I think we are part of the problem we are all facing is that in a way we are flying, <coughs> flying blind here. We, we, we frankly don't have much information to assess, for instance, how much damage countries, companies are inflicting on each other um, and on society as a whole. So in other words, we must do a better job at understanding and mitigating externalities, right? And what I mean by externality, because we've all used the word, but it's anything that disturbs the level playing field between individuals, companies, and countries, right? So let me give you two concrete examples of what I think are achievable goals uh, with hopefully enough consensus. One is to curb excessive concentration of corporate power pretty much everywhere in the world. We talked a lot about inequalities, but I think that's at the center of the problem. There are reasons to be optimistic. The OECD, OECD countries, as you know, have already achieved a minimum corporate tax. And I think the issue now is to tackle the issue of tax optimization and in particular transfer pricing mechanisms. Right. As you know, the uh, U.S. government is looking very seriously at the issue. Uh, Microsoft was uh, given a very significant fine just uh, a week ago or so. And, and I think, you know, to put things in perspective first, uh, you may know that, but, you know, it is estimated that $1 trillion of corporate profits each year are booked uh, in tax havens, right? Uh, it's a considerable amount of money, and I think we need to do more on that front, and, and that, you know, again, governments should have mutual interest because that's more money for their coffers, right? And the second goal uh, I'd like to illustrate in the area of climate change is that, you know, First of all, you know, deglobalization it makes it harder to achieve our uh, decarbonization goals, not easier, right? So I think that, that's a very uh, strong point to make. And to illustrate this point, uh, someone talked about the uh, WTO report that was issued just last week. One interesting statistic is that they looked at solar panels, for instance, over the last 30 years or so. And, and as you know, there's been a huge decrease in cost. And the WTO economists were able to assess that 40% of that decline uh, was due to economies of scale uh, that were obtained through international free trade. So, you know, um, at the up, in contrast, if we don't have this kind of economic efficiency, we are even less likely to meet our uh, decarbonization uh, targets, right? Um, so that's the fair point around, you know, m defining strong mutual interests, and hopefully not too many of them, uh, so that we don't get distracted. Again, it's like any uh, diplomatic exercise. Uh, the second point about having strong players, I think we talked about GDP this morning and <clears throat> uh, how the, the picture looks scary for Europe. In reality, in terms of PPP uh, basis, so in, in plain English, uh, adjusted for cost of living, uh, GDP in Europe is only 4% lower than in the US, right? Uh, and, and actually, if you look per capita, 
Europe is actually in a better situation now than it was 20 years ago. So we have to put things in perspective. However, this is today and, and, and the past. Going forward, uh, the situation is very weak for Europe, uh, which is missing essentially the technology uh, revolution. And just one statistic that is very revealing, uh, in Europe, private companies invest about $50 billion a year uh, in technology R&D. Uh, in the US, it's five times this amount, about $250 billion. And China, which started from zero 15 years ago, is now well above Europe. So, you know, with less uh, economic power, uh, the issue for Europe will be how relevant it can be on the international scene and still influence uh, the world. Uh, and, and then the second weak player for completely different reasons uh, will be emerging markets. And I think that that probably where we need to um, make collective decisions for the sort of long-term common uh, good, if you will. Thank you very much, John.